Welcome, bienvenido, bienvenidos to the IDC Dockers podcast on the waterfront, our podcast where we will know a little more about our struggles, our fights, our organization, our people, our future. Today is one of the historical days for IDC. It's the first uh, chapter that we make of this project for IDC for the 25th anniversary. And of course, we wanted to make the first interview to somebody that is, if it's not the most, is one of the most influent people from the labor movement on the docks, uh, Mr. Dennis Daggett, the general coordinator of IDC, executive vice president of the ILA. Welcome, Dennis. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Okay. We are here in New Jersey. Dennis, for well, for me, Dennis is uh, one of the one of the the persons uh, or the person that have inspired more and more in my life. He really changed my life. My life. We we spent a lot of beautiful, a good times, and also a lot of hard and and tough days. But uh, but always with the same day, with the same objective, the same challenges. So for me, it's a pleasure here to have you in this first day. And we'll come to on the water from okay we have prepared uh, three parts the first one will be uh, speak about your history on on the longshoreman as the longshoreman of the ila after about idc on the future of, of what do you see in the sector okay so it would be it would be easy for everybody to understand and especially for the people that will be mostly the workers so explain us a little how you start on the docks uh, and and how you start on the union level too, which is your... Yeah, so um, my family uh, has originated from the west side of Manhattan, uh, lower Manhattan, in Greenwich Village. Uh, I'm a fourth generation ILA member. Uh, matter of fact, my family has uh, been longshoremen, dock workers, uh, even prior to the ILA being commissioned in 1892 uh, with my great-grandfather. Uh, and then later, when it was commissioned in 1892, he was served as a proud member of the ILA. And all on my fraternal side, both my grandfather and my grandmother, both of their families, the Daggett's and the Clarks, all worked uh, down on the waterfront. My grandfather was a loft boss at Pier 32 in Lower Manhattan. And, uh, and my dad followed in his father's footsteps. My, my dad tried to get into the Clerks and Checkers Union in, in 67 when he... Uh, when he was uh, discharged from the Navy. And uh, unfortunately, he couldn't get in there. Um, he, and then somehow he, he worked his way into the, uh, the maintenance local, uh, which, which at that time was called 1804 uh, in the Port of New York. And, and uh, so growing up, I grew up around the business. I grew, our local was on Greenwich Street, um, 403 Greenwich Street in Lower Manhattan. So as a young kid, I, you know, I, I would run through the offices and the hiring hall downstairs, and I love to be around the people of the ILA. And then, you know, having friends in my own neighborhood and hanging out with their parents and their friends, it just was never the same. Like the people of the ILA, to me, and the cast of characters, especially back then, I was just so drawn to it. And my dad became a union official in 1980 uh, when he left Sealand as a, he was a foreman in a warehouse at the time. So my life in the union is kind of, in reverse compared to everybody else. So I learned the internal part of the union before I actually learned the operations on the waterfront. And you bought the union. <clears throat> yes. So the internal part of the union is what I was more exposed to as a kid than, than the actual docks. So growing up, you know, I've been to every single quadrennial convention since 1983. And at that time, uh, the legendary Teddy Gleason was our international president. And all of the officers in, of uh, the locals in New York and New Jersey, I grew up around all them. And I was just memorized, mesmerized by, by all of them. And, and, you know, when I was a kid, they used to make fun of me a little bit because when all the other kids were, you know, playing in the pool, you know, having fun, playing basketball or, or do, going in the ocean, I, I stayed in the meetings. Hmm. And I was just enamored by... By, by President Gleason and, and so many other officers, um, and not just from the Port of New York, but from other ports up and down the coast. And I just, I, I just, I guess it was just in my blood. I just loved being around it. And I remember I wasn't the greatest student in school. And in the third grade, <clears throat> we had an essay contest, which back then really was just a paragraph. 
and I wrote that you know when I when I get older I want to be a, a delegate in the ILA yeah. and I actually won the essay contest and you know my dad always tells stories too that for some reason I always just wanted to be around the ILA I didn't care about anything else um, I was just drawn to it so when I was 18 years old I got an opportunity to, to work on the docks and I worked for a company called Bay Container at uh, it was, a, it was a maintenance repair company at uh, Universal Maersk and when I started working there at, at a young age everybody treated me like a man and I and I liked that feeling and I liked the camaraderie in the port area and, uh, and on the terminals and I made a ton of friends and I, and I loved the brotherhood and the sisterhood of uh, and the whole ILA family and I was drawn to it and and there was my dad wanted me to look at other career paths and I just, I refused to. I just always wanted to be in the ILA. Now, thinking about being an official in 1804-1 was really just a dream. Yeah. I didn't think that dream would ever become a reality. So I was just happy to work on the docks and be around all the guys. And um, and eventually down the road, I got an opportunity to be a representative of the local. And it was the greatest honor of my life. And, and the rest is history. Wow. Okay, yeah. It's history. Yeah. One of the things that amazed me that is about the ILA is that it's a it's a real family. I, I just been in some conventions. I my kids play with the ILA kids, so it's all together. So I really love to see the family sharing together. It's something that don't happen around the world. It's something that it's especially here. So and I think that makes you more strong, stronger than 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 any union in the world. That was an original idea from Teddy Gleason at that time. Yeah, Teddy. When when we would have our quadrennial conventions, Teddy always wanted, and President Bowers did too. They always wanted to have the families there, and and uh, they wanted the families to kind of break bread with each other, uh, go to the social events at the at the conventions, and he wanted to, to to be like a family type atmosphere, and that tradition has carried on up until my dad's presidency, and I hope I hope it continues on forever, um, because you're right, you know, it makes us all feel like we're part of something bigger than 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 our than our own selves and in our in our own families, to be quite honest, so. You are. You're right. I, mean, I think it makes what it, it's what makes the ILA so strong, and is that we have this. You know, we're, we're we're very we're very big into our faith, and 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 we're big we're big we're big into our families. And most of the people in the ILA are family oriented, hard hard working, blue collar type people. And you know, quite honestly, they're, they're my favorite people in the world. They yeah. Really are. And now we approach to one of the big challenges for the ILA, that is the master contract. So sometimes people. From, especially from outside, they don't understand that what, what you guys are fighting here and the ILA is fighting is among everything is that to protect the dog workers from automation. It's something that sometimes people don't understand from outside. They think not just from the dog, from outside of the sector, you know? Yeah. Yeah, the so <laughs> you know, we 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 have a strong stance against automation. Um, you know, certain technologies we support because it makes the job more efficient and a little bit easier, but as long as a human being is performing that job. But, it, but in regards to automation or semi-automation, uh, no, we're, we're completely against any type of robotics taking over an actual human being's job, especially the job that we've historically worked, you know, all, you know for since 1892 and even longer. Okay, we're gonna win, you know. We're gonna win. That's there, there's happy. no question. We're gonna win. <laughs> and you will get the best contact for, for it. Like, what do you or what do the ILA expect from the ADC in, the, in that stage? Well, there's a couple of things here. We're, so we're, we we are we're we're we're, we're going to negotiate. We believe we're going to negotiate the best contract that this union has ever seen. And I, and I know that um, we've said that in the past, but. With, with the amount of work that we put in and, and preparation that we put into our proposals and just taking notes and, and record of all of our disputes over the last six years. And I think, and you saw the presentation yesterday and, and we cover it all. And, we, and we, don't just, we don't just cover it for one craft, we cover it for all Thank three you. crafts. But I think more and more because of your participation with the ILA uh, from the IDC, um, we also been a member of the ITF going back, you know, decades. With, with even when Teddy was around, I think. But the, but I do believe more and more. And as you saw at our quadrennial convention, we had a lot of international guests from from other dock worker unions, which I thought was great. And our delegation and our members loved that, and they loved to hear because you know, let, let's face it, our industry is very unique, and 
you know, it's all this, like I always say the story, if you blindfolded me and, and put a sleeping agent and what, I woke up in Spain and I woke up in the middle of the terminal, I feel like I was in the same terminal here in the port of New Jersey. So we're very lucky in that sense. But I think our members and our delegates are, are more educated now on the international Docker movement, which I think is a beautiful thing and something that you and I as friends have dreamed of yeah, for, yeah. For, for, you know, well over a decade. Um, so, you know, what do we expect? I don't expect nothing less than the support that we're going to receive. And I think the relationships, more importantly, like, you know, we're talking about, you know, my love for the ILA and the relationships we've built over the years. Well, we're doing that now at the international level, right? And we've, we've built some incredible bonds with, you know, dockers from Australia, from, from South America, from Europe, from Africa, Asia now, you know, even in the Middle East. These are, th this, that, you know, my dream was always the ILA. I never thought when I was a kid that I, this, this thing could actually go bigger than that and go worldwide. So, you know, just like the ILA will be there for any of those unions, like the MUA with, with their CUBE dispute right now, you know, and we, we, without question, know that the MUA will be there for us. And it's a wonderful right. feeling. It's a and, wonderful feeling. Yeah. Okay, let's talk a little about the, about ABC. I'll give you three moments and you tell me which are your memories, okay? The first one is 2011, a Manhattan, a, a dinner in the Five Avenue. What do you can tell me about that? Yeah, so <laughs> Kenny Riley, I, 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 always, I always tell everybody that you know, I, I learned most of the international dock worker movement through our uh, international vice president out of South Carolina, Kenny, Kenny Riley. And Kenny was in discussions with my dad and I um, prior to the 2000 quadrennial convention where we had the election for international officers and, and also for the ACD officers. And um, so we scheduled a meeting with, with you all in Manhattan at, at Del Frisco's. And it was funny, we were in the car driving over there and my dad was telling Kenny and I, don't make any commitments. Let's hear them out. Uh, let's see what this thing is all about. And you know, we had a really good conversation in the car. Within, literally within two minutes of meeting you and the, and, and the other folks that were there, my dad goes, we're in. We're signing yeah. up. So that and that's and that's where you and I you and I met. We, we yeah, were the two yeah. young guys at the table, and uh, we hit it off right away. And, and and we've had that bond ever since. And that was that was a very special. And we moment. speak about automation. Remember, we started. We talked about everything that night. Okay. Everything that night. Second mm -hmm. moment, 2019, Algeciras seen the demonstration in the Spanish dispute. Which are your memories about that? I'll, I'll, I'll I'll just, yeah. I have to admit that to me. I mean, I know I, I understand the seriousness of that struggle. And, and and what you were all up against with the parliament and everything, but if you take that away just for a second, to me that was I think that was the most amazing moment in my entire life, and especially in, in my career in the ILA. I, I I remember being in that historic hotel and having the press conference with with, with, the, with the media and and you and you speaking and and I was just kind of soaking it all up. And we had all of our friends from around the world there. And when the, pre when, the, when the press conference was over and we had to walk down that, that hill to go into the port area and I, and I saw the smoke bombs going off and the chants and, and thousands and thousands of, uh, of dock workers and their families and their children yeah. were there and their wives were there and their, or their husbands. It was the most amazing thing that I, I've ever ex experienced in my life. And when you, when you talk about really rallying and picketing and supporting one another I'll never forget that moment, you know, and, and I, I got to share that moment uh, with Virgil Maldonado as well. Yeah. It was a, was a close friend of mine in the ILA and, uh, and Mark Christine at the time, uh, yeah. you know, God bless his soul. But um, yeah, to me, I will never forget that experience. I, I go back on my phone sometimes and I watch the videos just because I can't believe how, how, how much that impacted me um, and also inspired me. It really, I mean, that was just really, really inspiring. The last one, 2024, in the Conference of Liverpool. Which are your memories about? It was four months ago. Which was your feeling going to the castle, going to the Atlantic yeah. legend people? No, another, another special. I mean, this, this, is what I, this is what I was trying to explain a little earlier is, you know, my, my dream as a kid was just to be an ILA member. That, that, that was it. And then, you know, obviously you have pipe dreams where, you know, you want to be an officer of 1804-1 would be... You know, could, would that ever happen? And then, then later on, I never thought I'd be the executive vice president of the international, really. I mean, I dreamed of it, but I never really thought that would be a reality. And then 
I'm sitting in the, the midterm conference in Liverpool. I'm in Liverpool. Yeah. I'm sitting there with Sharon Graham, one of the most powerful union officials in the world today. And, and hearing her speech was so inspiring and hearing from all the other dock worker unions throughout the world. And I feel like um, since I've been working with you in the IDC, that even the IDC community, I feel like we have a, we, we've become closer, like a family, and it's more like a bond, and everybody wants to be there for one another and support one another. And it's just, it's just one of the most amazing things. And to be part of this movement is the, probably the biggest honor in my life. And also there are a lot of many inspiring stories, no? like around the world, like, for example, Juan P. in Ventanas, the, the young guys that build their own each quarter, that's amazing, the, the fights in Africa. What is, the, what is your... The thing that has amazed you from IDC perspective, the the situation that you say, what this is happening now here in Africa, for example, or in in Ventana, so which is the thing that you say, wow, this touched my life forever. A part of these three moments that was uh, historical. Yeah, yeah, so like the <clears throat> the conference that we went to in in, in uh, Quintero Ventanas was was amazing. The, the first the first thing that grabbed my attention was the how genuine the people are like what you mentioned Wampi is one of you know one of my favorite guys and just how genuine they are how warm and welcoming they were to us uh, in their country and how proud they they are of their country I, I loved all that <clears throat> but then there's a part where I get angry and I look at some what the employers are doing to, to some of these people and trying to exploit workers and, and not pay them enough and you know, fighting for for things like safety in the workplace and, you know, having companies like Maersk where people are doing a pe peaceful protest and they're they're paying off the government in, in, in not just not in Chile, but in other parts of South America where they're flying over in helicopters sh shooting machine guns at our people that are just peacefully protesting. And that stuff, you know, that stuff, uh, I, I get a rage inside and, and that that fuels my fire to want to fight more. In this movement. Now we are in a moment when we believe that that the international docus movement is stronger than ever. You, we see, the, for example, the alliance between the ILA and the ILWU. Uh, first with with Bobby in the previous two, two but with Bobby, especially uh, with Willie, especially now with Bobby, that an uh, amazing relationship. Also the IDC with ATF. Uh, so, which is the next step? Which is the where we go? In the next. Well, I, I think we have to give, and, we, and, I, and I know we do privately, but since we're on a podcast here, I think we have to give a lot of credit to uh, President Willie Adams from the ILWU. Yeah. You know, when we had that, that conference in, in uh, was it 2019 or 2020, uh, the MUA conference, where we we met in a room and we kind of checked, <laughs> President Adams did a great job of checking everybody's ego at the door and sitting down and saying, hey, this is about us representing the membership. This is not about our, our personal or individual egos. And a lot came out of that meeting. I don't think a lot of people realize. I mean, there was a lot of friction between the ITF and the IDC at the time. Um, the ILW and the ILA, we, we, were, we were coming together um, again, which, which thank God, you know, and I have a very good relationship with, with Bobby Alvera and Ed Ferris is a good friend as well. So... <clears throat> Out of that meeting, I feel like the movement came together closer. The IDC got stronger, and, and the relationship between the IDC and the ITF came together. And, um, you know, when the ILW was going through their, their conflict uh, last year, they had an International Solidarity Day, and here we are. We have, we have uh, Patty Crumlin and, and I sitting right next to at the table together, and Patty's a great friend. And, you know, it's what it's all about, but but Willie, but Willie was right. Willie, was, come on, guys, this is really about re us representing the membership, and this is what it should be about. Check your check your ego out the door. And since we've done that, I don't think. I mean, you 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 have more experience than I do than I do in it, but I don't think the international movement is, is, has ever been as strong as as it is right now. Hundred percent, hundred percent. One thing I, I have this feeling. I don't know if I, you, I can share with you. You you can share with me that we win a lot of battles. For example, we. Here in the States, you won against the Waterfront Commission, you won against the Leather Terminal, a lot of battles, but sometimes we don't celebrate enough. No? Then we say, okay, we have won, uh, we have to the next one. No? And, and it's also something that always I think and say, well, we have to get the, the, the victory in the Leather Terminal in Charleston, South Carolina. So 
wow, that's amazing. And we won't say, no, we won't do the next one. So. Yeah, you know, you're 100% right. I, we, we, we don't celebrate enough, but I don't think we have time to celebrate <laughs> well, enough that, because yeah. really what happens is that it's, it's just we get hit from every angle. So we, we're taking on, a lot of times we're taking on multiple conflicts at one time, right? Multiple battles at one time. So we, if we, we get through one, we have some success, we're on to the next one. It's like, it's, it's like we run the gauntlet and it just never stops. But, hey, that, that's why we do what we do and, and, and we love what we do. And, and um, you know, the, the, the most important people in the entire equation is, is our membership. And that's why we do what we do every day and their families. Okay. Now... Uh, I want to ask you something from your point of view, from your perspective. Which are the risks or big challenges that we have the dog workers for the next years? I mean, you mentioned automation, so you, the jurisdiction. Yeah, I mean, in, for the next five, ten, fifteen years. I feel like you know, with with automation and what you know, we're just seeing the beginning stages of artificial intelligence, AI. Um, it's a it's a scary world. That it, the, the vision that I have for the future. Um, it, it's it's pretty scary to think about. So I feel like our constant battle for the rest of our lives, you know, and moving forward is going to be our fight against automation. You know, and they're gonna they're gonna try to figure out different ways to pay off the current existing workforce. But we can't allow that. We can't fall for that because we have to fight just like our ancestors fought for us. We have to fight for future generations because you know one day maybe my son or daughter wants to be. A, a longshoreman because they want to follow in my footsteps. Well, I, w I want to make sure that they have a future and we can't sell out for anything and we won't sell out in the ILA, I know that. And with the IDC, you know, we're going to, we're going to push back in, in every country. Okay, last one. Uh, next year we will celebrate the 25th anniversary of IDC, also the Charleston 5. We are trying to organize some issues, but first I want that you send a message to all the, the workers, all the ranks, all the people that are looking the the podcast and and send a message to look at the commitment, the participation, the the, the pro that you are from to be a longshoreman and ILA and IDC. So you can send a message directly to the to the guys that are looking at you and say, "Wow, they missed that guy," you know. Well, I, I think I understand the question. I mean, the the message is we we, we need we need more involvement, right? Because if you if you're going to preach, and, and if you're going to preach solidarity. It, that means everybody's got to be involved. And I, and I always tell everybody in, in, my, in our local here that I represent that when I walk into a room and the employers are there and, and we're battling on some issue, they're not intimidated by me. They're intimidated because they know I got 1,700 mechanics that stand shoulder to shoulder with me and they're ready to fight at any second. And that's what we got to send the message to the whole world because we are nothing without the support of our members. And everybody has to realize that. I don't care. You know, we talk about, you know, leaders and some, pe some people, which I, I don't really particularly like, self-proclaimed self leaders. No. We are the voice and the representative of the rank and file. But without the support of the rank and file, you are absolutely nothing. And I think by educating that, you know, the leaders that we, that we deal with throughout the world, and like New Orleans was the perfect example. We had the conference in New Orleans. More people came to that conference than probably ever, right? Yeah. And, and when they left there, they said, oh, this movement is something so powerful, and I want to be a part of it. So I, I feel like every conference we have, I think the next one's going to be even bigger. Our midterm conference was fantastic. So we're, we're growing at a rapid pace, and people want to be involved, and people are understanding it. And just in this country alone, right now, there's a 70% approval on unions. We haven't seen that since the 1950s. Wow. So the biggest thing is we need participation and we need activism and, and we, we, we know that we have the determination and the will to fight, but we need our members' support or we're, not, we're nothing. Well, like like always, then it's inspiring. You know, uh, yesterday I, I was with some of the guys there in, uh, at the afternoon and, and I told them, no, then this is my bent. And I told them and we were speaking so much and I really can't thank you enough to all you do for, for the ILA, for the ADC, for our people, our families, and especially in a personal level because you changed in my life and we, we speak about. So that's the end. Well, I just, can, I, can I answer that? Of course. Because I, I disagree with that. I, I, I don't <laughs> we think... Are disagree to we, we are agree to disagree. <laughs> I, I don't like it. I disagree with that because there's, there's no way I'm your mentor. I, th <laughs> I think we make a really good team, yeah. you know, and I think... 
um, the, the, we have many things in common, but I think the best thing that we have in common is that our love and our passion uh, for representing dock workers. That, that's the number one thing. And we don't care who gets credit. We don't care about any of that. We just want results and we want victories. And you and I work really, really well together and we think a lot alike even though we're born in two different countries and we speak two different languages, or you speak five and I speak one. <laughs> no. But I think that you and I make a really good team and I wouldn't want to do this with anybody else. Yeah, 100%. It's the same. So thank you, Dee. That's the end of the first IDC Docker podcast on the waterfront. And remember that if we are together... Together, it's impossible, it's impossible to fail. To fail.